alone are worthy to be praised. And Father, this evening, we just ask that you would inhabit the praise of the people, that you would speak to us and that we would hear and respond because Lord, not because we have to, but because we love you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. And all God's children said, Amen. Awesome. You may be seated. All right. Uh, open your Bibles to 2 Samuel 15. Prayerfully, we'll dip into chapter 16 a little bit in probably just four verses. But this evening, I've broken our verses up. And, and by the way, if you need a Bible to follow along, the ushers will put one into your hands. Uh, so 2 Samuel 15, uh, we got, we made it to verse 27. So we'll pick it up there. Uh, maybe we made it to 28, but uh, we'll pick it up there and, and kind of rewind just a little bit. But I've di divided our verses this evening into three sections. Verse 27 to 29 to discernment sought. <coughs> verse 30 through 37, despairing spirit, and verse one through four of chapter 16, deceitful servant. Now, it is important that you and I, that we have a knowledge of God's word. It's important that we not just memorize it, but that we live it. And the problem we're gonna see as we go through this is David may know God's word, but he isn't living it. See, we need the New Testament and the Old Testament. We need the complete Bible in order to be complete Christians. So important. Martin Luther once said this. He said, I have made a covenant with God that he sent me no, that he sent me no vision, no dreams, nor angels. I am satisfied with the gift of the scriptures, which give me an abundant instruction. <clears throat> And all that I need to know, both for this life and for that which is to come. And so I love his heart. Listen, a lot of people are looking for dreams and visions. They're looking for, you know, this funky feeling. I feel like it. Listen, we've got God's word, and it's so important that we rely wholly and solely on the word of God and not so much on feelings, dreams, visions, and whatever else you have. Now, we also need to understand that when we have God's word, we need to humble ourselves before God's word. It is baffling to me. It's baffling to me that people uh, can know God's word. You can give them God's word and they will say, yeah, but this is how I feel. Yeah, but this is what I'm going to do. And I don't understand. Listen, when I'm giving God's word, it is imperative that I humble myself before the word of God and, and just get rid of any kind of traditions or my own human reasoning. Receiving and responding to God's word is an act of humility. And that's what we need to see here as we look at the humbled king. Now, do you realize there's a difference between humbling yourself before God and God humbling us? <laughs> oh, yeah. I personally pray that I can humble myself before God before he has to humble me. Amen. But either way, God wants us to be in right standings with him. And if need be, he will humble us. Now, let's get up to speed. David's being humbled. Absalom is in rebellion, Absalom being his son. He's rebelling against the king. He's rebelling against his dad. Actually, in all honesty, he is rebelling and fighting with God. And when you fight with God, when you rebel against God, it's a losing battle. You know, God said in Deuteronomy, he said, honor thy father and mother and you will have long life. Absalom is going to miss that verse. Yet, we can't put it all on Absalom. In David's case, he has failed to confront his son. He has accumulated his own sin and piled upon pile. Listen, David is in a spiral down spin. He's in a tailspin, out of control. His life is out of control. But this is what God is using to humble the king. So let's look at discernment sought in verse 27 through 29. Some of this is going to be 
repeat, but I think it's good for us to get the flavor. The king said to Zadok, the priest, are you not a seer? Now, he's a man of spiritual insight. That is awesome. I love the fact that the priest is loyal to David. Uh, which is important besides the fact that, you know, David is being called, uh, he is called the king by God, but also for a priest not to be loyal to the king could also mean death if you have the wrong king. Thankfully, he's got the right king. But when David says to Zadok, the priest, he says, uh, you're a seer, that means he has good discernment. David has seen in Zadok a, uh, a spiritual discernment that has been upright and good. Uh, that's what you want though, right? That's what you want in a pastor, in a leader, in, in this situation, a priest. Uh, one who is uh, spiritually sensitive. One, in this case for David, one who is spiritually sensitive to Absalom's evil. Uh, also, listen, you want one that's spiritually sensitive to what God is doing and what, which way God is directing. There's nothing worse than, have, than having someone that you're trying to follow or someone that you're looking for counseling from who is not sensitive to God's leading and is more about what they want or not want. In this case, he's saying, hey, you're a seer. Don't you see, don't you discern the will of God? And notice David didn't, even though Zadok's a priest, David didn't refer to him as a priest. He refers to him as a seer. And as I mentioned last week, listen, every Christian should have some level of discernment. Now, what's going to determine how much of discernment you and I have? It's going to be based on how much of God's word is active in our life. How much of God's word are we obedient to? <laughs> how much of ourselves are we willing to die to? That's going to make me more sensitive and more able to hear from God. If I'm stuck in Randy, Randyville, all I can hear is Randy's will. In Randyville, I hear Randy will. I need to be in the word of God in order to begin to hear from God. And so back then, now I also mentioned this last week, back then they didn't have the Holy Spirit in them. They would have the Holy Spirit around them or upon them. We have something far more than just God's spirit around us. We have God's spirit in us, or at least we should. Listen, I love this. It is a supernatural thing when you and I can discern the will of God. We have no idea. We take it for granted. You know, people are always like, you know, God told me this and God told me that. Do you realize how amazing that is to be able to hear direction from the one who created the universe, one who holds and sustains every atom and molecule, and you heard from that guy? Yeah. Wow. When was the last time you heard from the president? <laughs> but you and I, <laughs> did he call you? He called you. Trump called you. All of us. All of us. All of us. Oh, that, I was like, hey, we should talk. <laughs> Uh, I'm talking about personally, one-on-one. -on -one. Listen, but you and I, <laughs> but you and I, you and I can hear from God on a right. That is super. That is incredible. That is not something that should be taken for granted. And also know this: this is an indictment. They didn't have the completed canon of Scripture. We do. We do. And yet, so often, in my own heart and many of those around me, I find that we find it difficult to discern the will of God. That falls on us. Now, we shouldn't, just be careful with this, we shouldn't all have um, a judgmental discernment. We have to be careful not to confuse discernment with being judgmental. <laughs> The problem is too many people that say, oh, I have discernment. What they really have is a judgmental heart. Listen, true godly discernment is going to lead you to a deeper love and compassion for others. Not a look down your nose and point your finger and wag your head at somebody else. That's not discernment. 
That's judgmentalness. That's being judgmental. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> now, discernment, you know, having, being filled with the Holy Spirit, discernment isn't the only thing that we gain from a life that is uh, subject to the Holy Spirit. I've often said that you'll know that you're walking in the Spirit based on how much of a servant you are to others. And of course, last week I also mentioned, and I must re, uh, reiterate this because it's very important, Galatians 5.22 gives us a list of the fruit of the Spirit. You know, so often people want to say, you know, uh, I'm Spirit-filled. Well, how do you know? Well, I speak in tongues. Well, look at this. Galatians 5, 22 through 23 says this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Nowhere is listed in there prophecy, <laughs> healing, or speaking in tongues. These, are, these fruits of the Spirit are all things that are far more valuable in the body. I'd rather have someone who's full of God's Spirit, who's loving and full of joy and peace and long-suffering and kind and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control than to have a hundred people that speak in tongues that aren't loving, that aren't full of joy, that don't have peace, that aren't long-suffering, that aren't faithful. And when you look at these gifts... Realize that all of these gifts are not for you. They're for others. It's not for you. It's, it's listen, it's so that you can be a servant in your marriage, servant in your family, servant at your work, servant to your friends, and most definitely a servant in God's house. So important. So important. But David, David turns to Zadok, the priest, and he says, so the king said to Zadok, the priest, are you not a seer? Return to the city in peace, you and your two sons with you. Ahimaaz, your son, and uh, Jonathan, the son of uh, Abiathar. See, I will wait in the plains of the wilderness until a word comes from you to inform me. Therefore, Zodak and Abiathar carried the ark of God back to Jerusalem, and they remained there. In other words, David's saying, look, 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 I, I trust you. You be my eyes and ears. Don't come with me. Go back to Jerusalem. Take the ark back where it belongs. But while you're there, <laughs> you can be helpful to me. Notice. Notice what's missing here. I don't know if you caught this. You know what's missing? Zadok doesn't complain. He doesn't complain. He doesn't say, David, <laughs> we just carried the ark out to you. Now we got to take it back. Uh, you do realize that we have to carry it by hand. We can't put it on a cart. You do realize it's made of gold, right? <laughs> so it's heavy. Not only that, I don't know about you. Would you want to travel across the desert without their priests? They're not soldiers. Uh, <laughs> carrying a big old chunk of gold. Wow. Yeah. But he doesn't complain. He does what the king says. He is a humble priest. I love that. I love that. Listen, you and I, we need to be ready to serve God in any capacity and not use our own logic or reason. You, well, you know how hard that is to do that, God? Uh, yeah, but I'm going to equip you. I will bless you for your faithfulness. You know what? You'll be a seer. Why? Because you're walking in obedience. No wonder he's a seer. He, he doesn't complain. He's like, yes, king. And he takes the thing, and they walk it all the way back to Jerusalem. Heavy, uphill, downhill, in the heat, hot. Scary if someone's going to come and rob them. But he trusts in the Lord. That is why Zodak, Zadok is a, is a, a seer. It's obedience. You want to be able to hear God's voice? Submit yourself to whatever God asks you to do. And don't complain if it's difficult or if it's hard, or maybe even if you don't like it. So what? This life is simply a test. Will you be humble or will you be humbled? <laughs> I pray that I would humble myself before God because he's worth it. Let's look at the humble king. Let's look at the despairing spirit in verse 30 through 37. So David went up by the ascent of the Mount of Olives and he went and he wept as he went up. 
Now, I, I made this closing connection last week, and I, I, I said, hey, let's jump, let's pick it apart a little bit more here. I love the, the connection here. There's a lot. David went up the ascent of Mount of Olives and wept as he went up. Jesus descended and wept as he came down. David has been ascending and descending and ascending all at the same time. He's ascending physically, he's descending emotionally, but he's ascending spiritually because he's gonna be praying to God. That is awesome. Though physically he's ascending, emotionally he's descending, he feels defeated. He's worried, his son has turned against him. Israel is turning against him, but spiritually he's ascending. So he's got this roller coaster in his life. But here's the thing, opposite of Christ. David ascended physically, Jesus uh, descended physically, willfully. David is descending emotionally, Jesus was ascending emotionally. He was pure, he was crying because he was pure love coming out of Christ for the people. David is ascending spiritually and Jesus was ascending spiritually because Jesus was obeying his father and he was going to lay down his life for you and I and he knew that would be glorious. Wept as he went up. David wept as he went up because he's broken and humble. Now remember why, <laughs> remember why David is crying right now. He has sinned, his son has turned his back on him, is rebelling. But remember way back in chapter 12, Nathan said to David, now therefore the sword shall not, excuse me, the, short, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus saith the Lord, behold, I will rise up, I will raise up an adversary against you from your own house. Now David is weeping from his sin. Listen, hear me, hear me carefully, folks, brothers and sisters. Sin will make you weep eventually. Eventually. It may not make you weep today or next week, but it will catch up to you and it will make you weep. I've never met anyone who was caught in their sin that didn't weep, that didn't stress, that didn't lose sleep, that wasn't frustrated but it was always by their own doing. We have a humble king here, David. And he said this, and he had, and he had his head covered and went barefooted. So he's deeply lamenting. He has his hair, he's a, it's an embarrassment. It's like death. And all the people who were with him covered their heads and went up weeping as they went. Listen, the people are loved. These people are following David because they've seen David have a compassion for them. That's one thing we can say about David is he's always seems to be compassionate towards God's people, even in his sin. So here they are following David, their king, their champion, and they're weeping with him, deeply mourning. In a sense, David is having fellowship with Christ. You're like, what? Listen. A verse that, that has rung in my heart a million times is Philippians 3.10. And it says this, that I may know Christ and the power of his resurrection. And you go, yeah. And the fellowship of his suffering. And David is, he's having fellowship with a Christ-like suffering. And you're like, really? Yeah. Do you know what Christ's suffering was? It was not the cross. He, the, the Bible says the joy that set before him, he endured the cross. The suffering of Jesus was to love so deeply and to be rejected. David has loved his family. He has loved Israel. He has been the defender of Israel. And now David is rejected by his son who he loves deeply. David loves his son so deeply that he has been failing to discipline his children. That's a bad love. That's not real love at all. 
But David is being rejected by his own son, who he loves deeply. He's being rejected by his countrymen that he has laid his life down for them on numerous occasions. Isn't that like Jesus? Jesus was rejected by his family. He was rejected by the country. He was rejected and is rejected often by the whole world. Yet, no greater love has a man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. <laughs> the only difference, David's rejection is a product of his own sin. Jesus' rejection is a product of man's sin. My sin, your sin, our sin, the world's sin. But nonetheless, a picture of Christ in King David in the sense that he is rejected by his own countrymen, by his own family members. Verse 31. Then someone told David, saying, Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. And David said, Oh Lord, I pray. That was not news that David wanted to hear. But I love this. The two most powerful words you and I can say in any time, whether it be joyful time, whether it be a heartbroken time, whether it be a neutral time, just simply to go, oh, Lord. That's powerful to call upon the name of God. To go into prayer. And you'll see why. And we've talked about Ahithophel earlier, but let's continue. So he says, oh, Lord, I pray. Turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. He fears Ahithophel's counsel more. Look at this. He fears Ahithophel's counsel more than he fear, fears Absalom's mighty warrior mentality or, or Absalom's army. He fears the counsel of Ahithophel. Usually, usually when someone says, oh, that guy, he's all talk. You don't fear that. But in this case, Ahithophel is all talk. He's not a warrior, but his, his words are powerful. Because over in chapter 16, when we get there, in verse 23, we won't get there today, but look what it says. 2 Samuel 16, verse 23, in the very next chapter. And the counsel of Ahithophel, which he counseled in those days, was as if a man had inquired at the oracles of God. So no wonder David, no wonder David is freaking out. It's not bad enough that, that Absalom has all of Israel on his back uh, behind him in support. But then to have Ahithophel, which everyone looks at, whatever Ahithophel says, it's like the oracles of God are being spoken and he's on Absalom's side, man oh man. Numbers are stacking up against him. Problem. Who's still on David's side? God. God is. Was that Trump? <laughs> He's calling again. <laughs> Just messing. Then, but but let, me, let me say this. That old saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hear. You realize that's not really accurate. That's not accurate at all. Oftentimes, words can leave deeper scars than a knife can. That's why, do you realize that is why God hates gossip? See, gossip is, is just the murder of a person. It's murdering them over and over again while they're still alive. It's called character assassination. So words do hurt. And here, David is afraid. David is concerned about Ahithophel's words, his counsel that he would give to all of Israel. Because obviously, in the past, Ahithophel was David's counselor because David saw a godly wisdom. And once again, let me, let me draw this, draw us back to this. Even a godly man or woman can have bad counsel or go astray from God from time to time. And that's exactly what's going to happen to Ahithophel. Now David cries out to God, Oh Lord, turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. And in chapter 17, that is exactly what God's going to do. 
God will do it, and God is going to do it by using the guy that we are now going to be introduced to. Let's continue. Verse 32. Now it happened when David had come to the top of the mountain where he worshipped God. Now, real quick before we get... Um, when we worship God, I want you to hear me. This is important, folks, because I think the church, we miss this. When we worship God, that is when we do our best fighting. That is our best fighting. Remember, or maybe you're not familiar with it, in 2 Chronicles 20, in fact, the worship team, we were talking about this just this last, um, last week. In uh, 2 Chronicles 20, uh, Jehoshaphat, appoints men to sing to the Lord and praise him and he sends them out before the army in battle and I often think can you imagine if you were a singer at that time you're like uh, excuse me uh, I lost my voice <laughs> send someone else <laughs> like, he sends out the worship team you know it's funny when I was in high school all the tough dudes played football and all the wimpy guys sang in the choir. And it blew their mind when I quit playing football so I could go sing in the choir. <laughs> They're like, what happened to Randy? <laughs> but here in God's economy, the mighty ones are the ones who are worshiping. Worship is powerful in the presence of God. Now I think about David. David would worship, and I imagine he would worship in both major key and minor key. He would worship on a mountaintop in a major key, and then in the deep valleys, he'd worship in the minor key. But what is David doing? David is worshiping. So many people, it, it blows my mind, I'll be back in the back, and people are coming in late, and they come in late regularly, and I'm thinking, these are people who don't understand the power of worship. It's just songs. It's just music. It's just singing. It is more than that, folks. I can pull out hundreds and hundreds of verses in the Bible that speak of worshiping, and we could exhaust the evening just reading verses on worship. Well, let me give you a few. <laughs> John 4, 23. But the hour is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And watch this. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. Wow. Who is he seeking? Those who worship in spirit and truth. Those who value the worship and praise of our God. How about Isaiah 42, excuse me, 43, 21. This people... I have formed for myself, they shall declare my praise. We were formed by God to declare his praise. And what a beautiful way to do it, set to music. How about Psalm 66, 4? We'll just do one more. All the earth worship you and sing praise to you. They shall sing praise to your name. All the earth was created. And I love that one scene where Jesus is writing in and the scribes and Pharisees and people are like, Hosanna, Hosanna. And he says, they say, hey, get them to shut up. And he says, you know what? If I told them to be quiet, the rocks, the stones would cry out. And yet, so many Christians won't sing to God. It's not important to them. That's the warm up. That's the filler until the pastor gets here. You know, I, um, someone from the worship team loves to remind me that when we get to heaven, I'll be out of a job. <laughs> but we'll all be worshiping. We will all be worshiping. There will be no, no more need for Pastor Randy to proclaim the word of God because the word of God will be right in front of us. And I guarantee there won't be a person who says, well, I'm not the singing type. You're out of here, bud. There's a place, you know, there's a place where no singing will take place and you don't want to be there. We were created to worship him. Listen, and then the benefit is the battle is won in praise and worship. And David, he doesn't know it, but he's winning the battle by seeking the Lord. 
So David's worshiping. And there was Hushai, the archite, coming to meet him with his robe torn and dust on his head. Who is this Hushai? Well, 1 Chronicles chapter 27, verse 33 says this, Ahithophel was the king's counselor and Hushai, the archite, was the king's companion. We'll see that Hushai is David's friend. Now, not a typical Hebrew word for friend that they use when it says that Hushai is David's friend. It's not a typical word. It's someone who counsels in secret. In other words, David is the, uh, excuse me, Hushai is David's closest friend, the kind that you would let them know your deepest secrets that you wouldn't trust anyone else with. And we see here that David's closest friend comes with torn clothes and dust of compassion for David on his head. David has left his throne. Hushai is his closest friend. David's weeping and his friend comes without even seeing David and he's already weeping over what's going on. Hmm. But I, I noticed one, co one commentator made a cool, cool connection. He said this. He says, please note God's encouragement. Itai, the Gittite, in verse 19, a swordsman, a sword representing the word of God. Verse 24, you have uh, Zadok, the priest, a man who to intercede. And then Hushai, the archite, a comforting friend. These three men cover the aspects of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is the word made flesh, the sword. Jesus is our high priest who ever intercedes for us. Jesus is our comforting friend. And so here God has sent him the sword, the word, the intercessor, and the comforter in these three men in this one chapter. Isn't that beautiful? I, I didn't see that. I caught that from a commentary. I was like, wow, that is super, super cool. See, when we worship God, God will send us all that we need. He will send us all we need. Verse 33. And David said to him, if you go on with me, then you will become a burden to me. Now, the guy might be aged. We don't know. David isn't shrugging him off. What David is saying is he, uh, Hushai, I, I've got a better idea. One, so, you know, you don't slow us down. But also I have, verse 34. Verse 34. But if you return to the city and say to Absalom, I will be your servant, O king, as I was your father's servant previously, so I will now be your servant, then you might defeat the counsel of Ahithophel for me. So obviously this is what we know. Hushai, not only a deep companion that, that David trusted, but also at one time Ahithophel was a counselor to David, but he would go to this guy with the deep, so obviously a wise, godly guy. So he's thinking, okay, maybe your godly wisdom can outdo Ahithophel's wisdom and that maybe they will listen to you. See, I love this. I love, now D David's not con conniving here. It's not a conniving situation. Listen, and it's not that David isn't trusting the Lord. There's, there's a point where you and I trust the Lord, but we must be wise at the same time. It's like that old saying, you know, uh, trust God, but go ahead and lock your car. <laughs> you know, oh, I, I live in old bullhead. I'm just going to leave my doors unlocked. Why? I'm trusting the Lord. No wise. <laughs> I need a job. I'll just sit on the couch and trust the Lord to bring me a job. Not wise. You know, I long for a spouse, so I'll just hook up with the first person that shows interest, and I'll trust God to work things out. Not wise. <laughs> yes, we should trust God. But don't be foolish. Don't be foolish. Understand. So David is in scheming in the flesh. Why do I know this? Well, look at what he's been doing. He's been praying. 
Oh God, I pray. He's been worshiping. He's in a humble state. This is a God plan. How do I know? Well, because it's gonna work. <laughs> it's gonna work. Then you may defeat the counsel of Ahithophel for me. Whatever Ahithophel says that is against me, you say the opposite. This is great faith. David prayed that Hushai, the archite's counsel would be received and that Ahithophel, who speaks as if the oracles of God, that his counsel would be rejected and that is what's going to happen. <laughs> I love it. Verse 35. And do you not have Z uh, Zadok and Abiathar, the priests, with you? There? No, no, don't look, look, look. I love this. He says, look, you just go back there. You'll have uh, Zadok there, godly man that I sent back with the ark. And Abiathar, he went back. He says, don't worry, you'll have backup. I love this. Always be sure, always be sure that godly people will be like minded. If there's someone godly in a region, I love that when we, when Jennifer and I go visit somewhere or, you know, I go visit somewhere, if there's someone godly, you know what happens? Bing! We just, we, we click. We click. You ever experience that? It's like, I don't even know this person, but my gosh, after five minutes talking with them, there's just this fellowship that's deep in the spirit. So he says, go back. Don't worry. You're not going to be alone. There's some godly guys. I already sent them back. I love Philippians chapter 2, verse 2 and 4. Paul says this, Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind. Let each one esteem others better than himself. Let, look, watch this. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. So he says, look, go, you'll find like-minded men there. Or how about 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8? Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another, loving as brother, be uh, tender-hearted, and be uh, um, courageous. So we're to be encouraging to one another. We're to have like-mindedness. And he says, listen, you go back there, there's some other godly guys there, you won't be alone. And it's always good not to be alone, isn't it? <laughs> it feels better. So he's encouraging him. Therefore, it will be that whatever your heart, whatever you hear from the king's house, you shall tell to Zadok and Abiathar the priest. So in other words, what you hear and what your counselor give, tell them and they'll back you up. And they, those are the priests. So you got godly backup. Verse 36. Indeed, they have there with them their two sons, Ahimaaz, Zadok's son, and Jonathan, Abiathar's son. And by them you shall send me everything you hear. So you got the two priests, and then in order so I can know what's going on, you just send their young sons to boogie on down and tell me what's going down. Give me the heads up. So Hushai, David's friend, his companion, his counselor, went to do the city, and Absalom came into Jerusalem. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Let's move to uh, chapter 16. We look here at the deceitful servant in verse 1 through 4. When David was a little past the top of the mountain, there was Ziba, the servant of Mophibosheth, Say that three times fast. Now, remember Ziba. I told you when we were introduced to this guy that he is rotten. That he's not a good guy. This was back in chapter 9. David wanted to bless. Let me remind you who this is. David wanted to bless the descendants of Saul's family. Why? Remember he had, he had promised uh, uh, Jonathan, his, his best buddy, his uh, you know, they had a kindred spirit. 
And he said, look, I, I will bless your family. So he said, you know what? He remembered. He remembered that he had promised Jonathan to bless his family. So David says, is there anyone of Saul's family remaining? And so they sent for Ziba, who, who would be a, a servant to Saul. And sometimes when the family was all gone, a servant would take the place, would be a surrogate for the family. And so Ziba hears that David wants to bless Saul's family, and he shows up, he's a Ziba, at your service, what do you need? Lay it on me, bring me them blessings. And David looks at him and says, well, is there anyone else? Oh, thanks. And he says, oh, yeah, yeah, there's one, but he's a cripple, Mephibosheth. And remember that Mephibosheth was crippled when his nanny heard that Saul and his grandpa and everybody was dead, she wanted to keep him alive because he'd be the heir and parent, the next in line. So she's running with him. He's screaming and crying most likely and she falls and she cripples him. So he's crippled from the fall. And I, I remember this is a beautiful, beautiful illustration of our fall in Mephibosheth. But anyways, and David being like a Christ, but this guy Ziba is like, no, come on, this is a cripple. He calls him a cripple. He didn't say a young man needing some support. What, how awesome. No, he calls him a cripple. And of course, David says, okay, not only is Mephibosheth going to get everything from his dad, but you and your family are going to work double hard. All your kids are going to work for him, and he's going to eat all that you guys work for. Well, here comes Ziba. Oh, boy who met him with a couple of saddled donkeys and on them 200 loaves of bread, 100 cl clusters of raisins and 100 summer fruits and a skin of wine. And the king said to Ziba, what do you mean to do with these? Oh, well, real quick, real quick, a skin of wine. Um, oftentimes, you know, people think, well, wine, you know, we think of wine today, but understand, uh, they didn't have uh, Dasani and Arrowhead where you can buy clean water. Oftentimes, it, to, to uh, help your health, it'd be better off if you ate some, or excuse me, if you drank crushed grapes. You know, they didn't have um, Pepto-Bismol you know, up the road where you get upset stomach. So they would use wine just kind of all around, but it wasn't, often it wasn't fermented. It was just crushed grape juice, especially, watch what it's going to say about the wine. And the king said to Ziba, what do you mean to do with these? So Ziba said, the donkeys are for the king's household to ride on, the bread and the summer fruit for the young men to eat, and the wine for those who are faint in the wilderness to drink. See, Crushed grapes is sugar. It's sugar. When you're feeling weak and you need a quick burst of energy, uh, who are growing faint to drink the, the, the grape juice, if it was alcoholic, it would make you more faint <laughs> in the wilderness. It's not good. Yeah, BC days. You don't want to be out in the heat and drink. It just intensifies the effect. It's not good. So oftentimes people read this wine and they think right away it's alcoholic. It's just basically crushed grapes and if you're ever like needing some energy to drink some grape juice it's great it's, or anything that has sugar in it will give you a boost now this guy comes to David and it seems like what a, what a lifesaver <laughs> right to David's heart why David has 600 men and their families to feed and so this takes a burden off of David it's a blessing for his men David's always concerned about his men and so, gosh, this guy hits him right in the bread basket. <laughs> Coin of <a> phrase. <laughs> then the king said, and where is your master's son? Where's Mephibosheth? And Ziba said to the king, indeed, he is staying in Jerusalem. For he said, today, the house of Israel will restore the kingdom of of my father to me. Ooh, liar, liar, pants on fire. He's trying to turn David against Mephibosheth. So the king said to Ziba, here, all that belongs to Mephibosheth is yours. 
And Ziba says, oh, I humbly bow before you that I may find favor in your sight, my Lord, O King. Wow. He comes deceptive. He gets what he wants, and now he's humbly bowing before the king. What a snake. A sneaky snake. A lying dog. Evil heart. You know, it's one thing. It's one thing when someone tells a lie. It's another thing when someone tells a lie against someone else and then plays like they're on the side of the person they're lying to. There's this saying that goes around, I, you probably heard it, a little white lie. A lie is a lie. And all lies, whether they're little white, little red, little green, little polka dot, I don't care what color the lie is, the lies are from Satan. Lies are from Satan. You know, I was sharing with you guys on Sunday, with y'all, um, how I don't like to teach kids about Santa Claus. Why? Because it's a lie. It's a lie. Then when the child grows up and they go, well, you lied to me about Santa Claus, maybe you're lying to me about this God thing too. Because wasn't Santa Claus have to do with the Jesus? Listen, there should be no lies. Well, I just want them to enjoy Christmas. No. Or what about, you know, your grandma knits you a sweater and it is hideous? And you go, oh, I just love it. I just love it. Well, good. I can't wait to see you wear it. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> then every time she sees you, she's like, where's the sweater I knitted you? Oh, it was dirty. I, it just more lies. More lies. It is better to say, Grandma, I love it. I'll keep it. But it's really not my style. But I know you worked hard, and so it's precious to me. Or how about this? You ever have someone come up to you and say, hey, how do I look? <laughs> Tell them. <laughs> My wife will ask me. She says, how does this look? I'll say, honey, it, you know, it's not, I like that other outfit you have. That, that looks great. Why? Here's the thing. If I tell her it looks good and it doesn't, and she comes to church and all her girlfriends say, ooh, that doesn't look good, Jennifer. She's going, honey, you told me it looked good. <laughs> I'd rather have her know that when she looks good that I mean it. If she cooks something and it's not good, I say, honey, it's just not, it's not that good. Then she knows when I say, oh, that was so good, she knows I mean it. There's truth there. Listen, we got to be careful, folks. Once we start telling one lie, it becomes a slippery slope. It's like, you know, I hear all these people say, you know, I want some good advice. You know, don't. If your wife says, how does she look? You say, great. You're, no, that's a lie. Your marriage cannot be founded on a lie. Ladies, if your husband says, does this shirt go with these pants? My wife, I'll come out. She goes, Honey, are you really wearing that shirt with those shorts? Oh, why does it not go? This is uh, you know, blue and purple kind of clash a little, or whatever color. I'm colorblind. I don't know. So you know what I do? I change. How, how's this one, babe? <laughs> Be honest. Don't try to butter someone up to get what you want. That's what this guy is doing. And know this, a lie is a lie that you're gonna to have to keep lying to sustain it. That's hard work. It's hard work to be a liar. It's so much easier just to go, bloop, there was some truth, deal with it. Yeah. <laughs> it's off me, I just, it's out. It's out there, I don't have to worry about it. I have to cover it up, I don't have to come back later. It's out, there's the truth. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. This guy is a liar, and it's going to come back to bite him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. As we look at your word, we thank you for a picture of a humbled king. Humbled, not by choice, 
but in the position he is humble. Lord, for us, for me, would you humble us where we need to be humble? And Father, may we hear from you so that we would humble ourselves where we can be humble before your hand comes upon us. Because Lord, it is far better to be in your blessed hand than to be in your judgment hand. Because you will chasten those you love. God, I know this. I felt this. I've seen this. And so Father, keep us in short account. Hold us close to you. And Lord, may we not stray. I pray for my brothers here and sisters here tonight that we would humble ourselves and under the love of our God. God, you have shown us over and over again that you love us so deeply, beginning with Christ and the sacrifice he made, continuing in the infilling of the Spirit. And finally, Lord, we can always go to your word and read your truth and cling to it. And so, Father, I, I pray for my brothers and sisters here. Speak them tonight and every day. May they have discernment and a deep connection where we get calls from you, Lord, for real. That you would call our number and call us out and call us to join you. Call us to serve. Call us to pray. Call us to forgive. God, we just love you. We need you. We adore you. We honor you. And Lord, we worship you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.